Hello, everyone, and welcome to Resolve's 12 Days of Investment Wisdom mini-series, where Michael Philbrick, Adam Butler, Jason Russell, and myself, Rodrigo Gordillo, will explore timeless, evergreen principles that will help you and your clients achieve long-term investment success. From the importance of asset allocation, thoughtful portfolio construction, and maximum diversification, our aim is to offer you a comprehensive framework for a more thoughtful investment approach that may change the way you view the complex arena of investing altogether. We hope that you enjoy the series as much as we enjoyed putting it together. Mike Philbrick, Adam Butler, Rodrigo Gordillo, and Jason Russell are principals of Resolve Asset Management. Due to industry regulations, they will not discuss any of Resolve's funds on this podcast. All opinions expressed by the principals are solely their own opinion and do not express the opinion of Resolve Asset Management. This podcast is for information purposes only and should not be relied upon as a basis for investment decisions. For more information, visit investresolve.com. Welcome back to what will be the final day. It was nice to, uh, yes, it is a bit of a sad day. I agree. Today, it's a very popular research paper adaptive asset allocation, dynamic portfolios to profit in just about any economic uh, environments. And we're going to drill into that case study and uh, share a little bit more than is in the case study there with you today and um, have a little bit of fun on our last day. Absolutely. And what we're really going to cover today is a practical application of a lot of the topics we went through. And we specifically want to give an example of how ensemble methods uh, may work. And the case study is going to involve using momentum, specifically multi-asset momentum. What we're going to do is kind of walk you through the the reasons and the things that you can um, deploy in terms of strategy construction that may benefit and and improve your outcomes for your strategies and your clients. So let's think about the idea of trying to capture a positive rate of return and a consistent basis that's above what you can get from a market cap weighted portfolio, or in this case with multi-asset momentum, if you can do better than a global market portfolio. So what we want to try to do with multi-asset momentum is, is, is to capture the momentum signal. We're going to use momentum as a case study, but what we want is uh, people to take away the fact that this framework we're going to lay out, it could apply to a value strategy, it could apply to a um, low volatility strategy. It could apply to anything, right? right. Light of vol- a VIX strategy. You can you can use adaptive it for asset allocation is a is a general concept that's applicable across whatever edge you might want to apply through the machine. That's right. Okay. So so let's let's think about this term momentum, right? What is it that momentum really is from the basics? Momentum is just herding behavior, and if we believe that humans will continue to herd then that is the only signal we care about. We want to do the best possible job of extracting that signal. If we're talking about value, what you care about is that there are undervalued assets that people aren't taking into account. And if you believe that that is something that that humans are going to continue to do over time, then you want to be able to capture that in the best efficient, least destructive way. So if we think about the momentum signal, is this signal going out into space? What we really want to do is capture you know, create antennas around that signal that are going to do a good job at, at, at harnessing that signal. And from the academic perspective, we talked about this in the past, is it's momentum is just um, ranking asset classes, ranking stocks from best to worst performing based on price differentials, so return based on percentage differentials, and uh, based on the last 12 months look back. Well, yeah, in academics, yeah. Academics, that's what they yeah, use. 12, 12 months look one. back, minus one, and, and, and then you, you rinse and repeat. And it might be just uh, instructive. In the paper, we just used six-month momentum. Yeah. So yeah. just as a, as a point of comparison so that you, you can flesh this out, is that that's not what we do in real life. The truth is that there's nothing special about that 12 months, right? And, and if we look at the many ways of ranking asset classes, you can rank them based on you know the last 20 days or rank them based on six and a half months or 12 months. If you go through the spectrum of look backs between 20 days and 300 days, what we find is that the long-term back tests show a very similar sharp ratio. It doesn't really matter what the look back is. Now, they might be slightly different from each other in short periods of time, but over the long term, they're both, all of those look backs do a pretty good job at capturing the momentum factor. They're highly correlated to each other. So if we know that, if we understand that, then, then the reality is that there is no optimal momentum look back. In fact, there is a series of optimal efficient frontiers, and that momentum ranking is not a point, but it's actually a range. 
And so what we're really trying to, to there, there's really two aspects to momentum. One aspect is what's the look back that we're going to use. And what we're saying here is that you don't need to choose. You need to just kind of be broadly correct about what the look back is going to be. Sometimes it's going to be optimal over nine months. Sometimes it's going to be optimal over three months. And it's going to ebb and flow over time. So we want to we want to kind of hug that signal as much as possible with the look backs. However, there's another dimension to this. We've just defined momentum as the percentage rank, percentage return rank. Well, what's so special about that? What if we were to rank asset classes based on their Sharpe ratio, the risk-adjusted return? Does that seem to kind of jive with that momentum factor? Is it it's a highly correlated to that? Is it is it from a theoretical perspective kind of doing what we want it to do? Yeah, that's another antenna that we could put in place to capture that momentum signal. Another way to look at it is days that an asset class has been above a certain trend or the distance between a short-term and long-term moving average. And, and we wrote a piece called The Many Faces of Momentum that people can go to our website and I, we'll, we'll provide a link to it on the um, show notes. But really, these are different ways of looking at, at trying to answer the same problem in different ways. It's no different than looking at value and saying that uh, price to book is is one way of looking at value, price to sales, uh, EBITDA to enterprise value, and so on. So there's many ways of capturing that signal. So what I'm hearing, just so I can summarize, in the paper, we looked at six months. In the other literature, they look at 12 months to measure momentum. And that's just like putting one antenna in the ground and hoping that you capture the signal and you get lucky with the with getting a good signal. Yeah, and that signal might have a slight, very tiny edge, right? That look back. And another uh, look back might have another tiny edge. And ranking them based on sharp ratio might also have a tiny edge. You want to do it across many look backs. So all of a sudden, you're you're creating thousands and thousands of different strategies. An antenna array. An antenna array. You're, you're just encapsulating that signal. So just to simplify things, let's, uh, let's assume that we have a five different or eight different momentum signals that we've identified. And each one of those signals, we're going to resample between 20 days and 300 days to capture the broad look back space. But we have eight different ways of measuring momentum. Well, that, that's fantastic. You now have are, are minimizing your chances of being specifically wrong, right? And you're trying to almost find eight, you've identified eight different managers, almost like a fund of funds. So that's one side of the equation, for identifying many ways of capturing your edge. In this case, it's momentum. The other side of the equation now is how do you weight these? We've talked about this throughout the series, but do we weight these asset classes? This The average of all systems give you a weighting, not a weighting scheme, it give you the, the winners that you should be investing in and excludes the asset classes you shouldn't be investing in. How do we then weight them? Think about it in the research paper, just to sort of ground this in, in some writing that we've done, right? Well, what we did was we did the top half, as an example, on a six month look back. Yeah. So now you have one antenna and one equal weighted portfolio, which we discussed a podcast or two ago about, you know, how you might think about constructing the portfolio and, and the portfolio optimization machine series and how equal weight is is maybe not the the best way to do it based on your beliefs. And then in the paper we walked through inverse fall. And so as you say, there are you can go a lot deeper. You've got you've got what have we got now? Eight different measures of momentum. You you mentioned eight and different then, measures of momentum, and now we got to figure out whether there's ways of uh, weighting differently. Is it right. equal weight? Is it inverse vol? Is it uh, maximum diversification? And so, what we care about is everybody now should know. We care about equating the risks across the board. And as uh, anybody who heard episode ten, there are many ways of creating risk parity portfolios. Now, this isn't truly risk parity in this case because we are, at any given time, we're excluding a ton of asset classes because it's a momentum thing. But within the asset classes that are left, now we can be more thoughtful about weighting. And do we want to just use one weighting mechanism? No. Let's, in, in the case of our strategies, I think we use five different weighting methodologies. So you got five different optimizations that are trying to find a, a, the risk parity portfolio. And you have eight momentum strategies. But now you can cross them, right? It's it's really five times eight. You end up getting now 40 different, what I call, I like to call virtual managers. These are all managers that think, these virtual managers think that their way is the best way. But because they're disagreeing with each other, what you end up having in this disagreement is you end up kind of eliminating the error terms. Disagreement is good. There's there's a level of humility that this, that you're infusing into the system by being humble about not not knowing which one of these managers is likely to do best, right? So if you think about the job of a fund of funds manager, 
The job of a fund of funds manager is to find the one strategy that is likely to outperform all the other strategies you could have invested in. And Adam, why don't you walk through this part of things, right? When you have a bunch of options to invest in and you, you can, you know, each one of them has a specific chart sharp ratio. When you put them together, what is a, the type of result that we can expect in a portfolio versus having to make that one choice? I mean, what is it that we're trying to get away, f uh, away with if we are explicitly trying to predict the future of any one of these back tests, any one of these strategies? The challenge in strategy design is that a lot of the edges that we've identified as being persistent, pervasive, sustainable, grounded in intuition, implementable, all those things are approximately equally as robust. They produce about the same long-term risk-adjusted performance. And if you look at the empirical sharp ratios, they're statistically indistinguishable. And, and that's true also for the variety of ways that you just described that we can think about measuring trend or the horizons that we quantify trend or the ways that we form portfolios of high-trending assets or high-momentum assets. And so all of these are equally legitimate. So how do you choose between them? Well, I, th I think when many quants start out, they go through a large number of different permutations of these different methods. And then they end up choosing the one that, that has performed the best in sample. But they neglect to explicitly account for the fact that the Sharpe ratio has a distribution like any other statistical variable. And that most of the time, the... Um, the distribution of sharp ratios encompasses all of the potential strategies that they've evaluated. So in other words, they're all kind of equally good. And then they, but they proceed to just choose the best one. And what we say is instead of having to make that choice and running the risk, the very substantial risk of being specifically wrong out of sample, instead of doing that, use them all. And what's so incredible and magical about using them all is that when, for example, you put together the 40 different sub-strategies that we use for our production um, adaptive asset allocation strategies, that the combination of all of these different sub-strategies produces a sharp ratio above the 80th percentile of what we observe from, from any of the single strategies. So you get this incredible gestalt effect where the whole is considerably greater than the sum of any of the individual parts. Right. So if, if we take it back to if your job is to be a fund of funds manager and pick the best performing one of these strategies, what are the chances that you're going to be better than the 50th percentile? I mean, it's generally quite low. It's a difficult task. The fact that we don't have to choose is the magic here. The fact that by using them all, and because Yes, they're highly correlated to each other. If you're doing a bunch of value uh, strategies, they're going to be highly correlated to each other, but they're not perfectly correlated to each other. And that slight difference allows for a higher higher diversification, higher sharp ratio. You land in the 80th percentile. So you don't have to choose to do well. And we see this now in, in, as you see the evolution of machine learning and these machine learning competitions. You, you could see what type of strategies these quants were putting into these competitions. There were single strategies, highly optimized, highly uh, data mined strategies that you know really, really didn't work out of sample that much. And what's most common in these competitions today is our ensemble methods. Absolutely, they completely dominate the Ada Boost methods, the XG Boost methods. All completely dominate the um, the more precise or specific applications that were favored previously. Exactly. So really, that's. We just wanted to give like a step-by-step -step good case study of how to think about the portfolio construction process, what the outcome is of creating multiple virtual managers and how this really makes it difficult for any manager to say, I, I, I found the best value metric or I found the best momentum metric. Yeah, or it, the best I, metric. I think what you guys are expressing here is this is an exercise in anti-fragility. You take one optimization with one estimate looking back as your, you know, your indication for what the mean will be in the optimization and, and use only one estimate for, for volatility and correlation, you are highly susceptible to being over-optimized and quite fragile. And it comes back to being 
generally correct rather than specifically wrong. We don't want luck. I don't want good luck and I don't want bad luck. Exactly. Exactly. What's so what's so powerful here is all of these different methods that we're describing are equally legitimate from a intuitive standpoint, from a mechanical standpoint, from an empirical standpoint. If you properly account for the error term in what we observe in simulation. But you you know, if you use any single one, you're vulnerable to the fact that that single implementation may just have a run of bad luck over the finite horizon that you're investing in it. So it's kind of like going back to the single player at the blackjack, or do you want to have 20 or 40 different players all playing blackjack at the same time where everybody pools their resources? There's a reason why the casinos don't allow that. Yeah. It's because it gives such a massive advantage well, to let's, players. Let's even flip that and say, why don't we be the casino where we have multiple games uh, at, in multiple locations. <laughs> Love it. Yeah. And, and so it's, it's not just, we're not just on the roulette wheel or, or subject to a, a bad uh, string of cards on blackjack. We have many different uh, card games, many different dice games, many different roulette type games across very many different betting sizes and horizons. And thus you get this very consistent return that stems from that because you're exploiting the edge the rules of those games are for the house to have a 50.5 percent edge and for the player to have a 49.5 percent loss where they think it's a coin toss but the house knows that it's a persistent edge now if you play one game over and over again you may have a losing streak that's going to kill you from the house perspective and what you're doing is creating not only multiple blackjack tables multiple roulette tables, but diversifying across different slight edges that you may have to minimize the the chance that over your one lifetime, you're going to be in truly bad luck. And it's not just a lifetime either. It's about how long you can stick with a strategy that's not performing as expected. So, I mean, we know from, listen, the Dalbar study's got lots of flaws, but I think one thing that we can count on is the observation of the typical holding period for an investor in an equity fund, a bond fund, or a multi-asset fund. And the typical investor holds a multi-asset fund for about four years. Four years. They, so they give it kind of four years to either out or underperform whatever the alternative multi-asset funds and they might, they might perceive that they can invest in. So, you know, it might be that a true financial investment horizon is 30 or 40 or 50 years. That's rubbish. The true investment horizon is however long the investor can stick with whatever the strategy is given the actual amount of potential for true loss or the amount of time that the investor might spend below or underperforming whatever his emotional benchmark is, period, full stop. And the idea of diversifying the bets is that you're just going to be susceptible to less bad luck. There's a string of bad luck going on in one of your areas of the casino. Let's call that the trend factor (laughs) right now. It's having a horribly difficult period. The value factor, also having a horribly different difficult period. If you've got an ensemble of different ways to look at the portfolio and different ways to optimize that portfolio, well, what's carrying the day? Some defensive, some low vol, some US stocks. So again, those are just- but it, just, And it's also important, like you said, uh, to minimize the chance that you have, you're susceptible to being hoodwinked by somebody who's had really good luck. Right. So you think about the line item is like, I need to find a momentum manager. I need to find a value manager. And your way of searching for that is a recent track record. That's the wrong way to go. Because yes, if we're saying that this ensemble method is in the 80th percentile, what that means is that 20% of those strategies did better than the ensemble. And so there's 20% of momentum independent managers that you might want to go and say, well, these guys are momentum guys too. And they're crushing you. They are Mm -hmm. crushing. Why would I give you money? Well, this is where you need to x-ray, not, not read the label, but rather look at the process. And so you want to look for managers that have a process that is diversified. You want to create strategies that are diversified. And you don't just want to say, I want momentum. I want value. I want defensive. And so I'll just look for the best performing track record. Oh, yeah. I mean, DFA is a great example. The price to book value metric is run across some some tough times. They do an amazing job at educating the, the advisors and clients, which is a wonderful thing that they do. But that that had they just taken, taken a more diversified approach 
in the way in which they looked at value, they would have super, they wouldn't be in the lowest percentile of potential <laughs> measures of value. I think every other value factor, every other way that you could you could suss out value has done better than price to book. And this is a this is a very relevant, timely, and specific example of why you don't want to just have one measure of any particular factor that you might be trying to harness. I love it. All right. Well, gentlemen, that has been high fives to all of you guys. That has Good been what a, marathon. A, a wonderful opportunity to share with each other, introduce a new team member and launch this mini series with you, our listeners. And so obviously if you've, if you've enjoyed the series, like, and share with your, your friends, I would also add that if you have other ideas that you think Resolve has a particular skill in and you'd like to see another mini series on another topic that you know we think we might be able to share some information with let us know some of our best ideas actually come from our constituent clients and and whatnot and, and potential clients so we do love that when you share that with us thank you for listening to our 12 days of investment wisdom mini series you will find all the information we highlighted in this episode in the show notes at investresolve.com forward slash 12 days You can also learn more about Resolve's approach to investing by going to our website and research blog at investresolve.com, where you will find over 200 articles that cover a wide array of important topics in the area of investing. We also encourage you to engage with the whole team on Twitter by searching the handle at InvestResolve and following Adam, Mike, and myself. If you're really enjoying this series, please take the time to share us with your friends through email, social media, and if you really learned something new and believe that our series would be helpful to others, we would be incredibly grateful if you could leave us a review on iTunes. Thanks again, and see you next time.